I don't think all of these military groups that are involved in, in this breakaway civilization, deep black uh, ET interaction, all of necessity interact with the same beings. Uh, again, even within the military, apparently human scheme of things, and I say apparently because some of the humans in these deep black military projects that interact with aliens are themselves hybrids of this, that, or the other ET race. Some of them are reptilian hybrids, some of them are uh, more mantis, and some of them manifest quite extraordinary metaphysical uh, powers, magical powers. And amongst the so-called friendly, benevolent ET races, they do have federations, they do have council meetings, they do have alliances with other beings. Whether it's to negate the malign influence of, of, of the reptilians and, and their allies, whatever the case may be. I've always said that what's happening in our solar system is merely an extension of cosmic wars going back millions of years. Reincarnation plays a big part in this. Many people remember not only past lives as, as a Terran, i.e. a human, but they remember past lives as being what we would call an ET. And they recall being involved as an, uh, as an ET in wars in, in the Orion constellation. Uh, different factions. There's the Orion group, as, as Alex Collier calls them, the uh, Orion uh, Empire, and the, the, the Draconian Empire. The Orion Empire seems to be a subsidiary of, of, the, of the Draconian Empire. Uh, those wing gargoyle beings I, I spoke about. So there, there are definitely alliances and, and counter-alliances at work. And there are councils and there are, uh, there are federations. It's, it's very unpleasant for a lot of these so-called serious researchers to contemplate, but it's true. Another show that I'm, I'm fascinated with is Thundercats. I've only watched a few episodes of that. But, but it, again, it deals with these feline aliens that are battling the reptilians. And uh, all these different races allied with the reptilians. There's canine beings, there's wolf beings, there's bird beings. Uh, some are aligned on one, one side or the other and some want to be neutral. And, and many of these different ET races are depicted in the Thundercats cartoon. Fascinating. I wish I'd seen it when I was younger. Uh, another show is, is V. The original V that, that shows these human-looking aliens coming in huge craft, but in reality, they're reptilians, and they eventually can gain control of politics, the media, and everything else. And and uh, and then a small band of uh, of resistance fighters develops, led by a woman. And there's there's a lot of metaphorical, metaphysical truth behind that because some of the best spiritual warriors I've found are women. They're heart centered. They have all these abilities. They don't operate from a place of ego, and they don't need accolades, they don't need fame or fortune, they, they tend to operate, the real players tend to operate on their own, under the radar, and many of them are women. So when I see this TV show, V, and it's led by a, a woman scientist or something, if my memory serves, that really, that really resonated with me. Perfect example, there's the film Stargate and the TV series, several TV series that went on after that for many, many years. And it's the idea that there's this big electronic device, a big kind of portal thing, and you step through it, and then you're in another dimension, or it's a wormhole into another part of space-time, and so on and so forth. Now, everything I know tells me that Stargates are very real. Uh, I don't know whether they're called Stargates or not, but um, um, in physics terms, they would be called traversable wormholes. There's a lot of... Um, uh, anecdotal, circumstantial, corroborating evidence that these phenomena are very real. They figured out how to do this, or they've been told by somebody how to do all this. And so if a whistleblower comes forward and says, look, you know, in Los Alamos, they've got this big Stargate thing, and it's in a special room, and you have to go through, and so on and so forth, and then there's this big round thing, and it's full of highly advanced electronics, and you go through, and the next thing you know, you're traveling into the future, and you're on the other side of the galaxy. Imagine a whistleblower said that then whoever they're talking to says, that's a TV series, come on, you know, pull the other one, don't just, don't think we're that stupid, now it's a television show, come on, get real. I think if you look at John Carpenter, the creator of They Live, if you look at his movie making history, which includes 
Satanism and, and, and horror and what have you. This guy um, has at least some knowledge of what's happening. And I, I had to laugh. Um, I said this in a book once, years ago. And someone wrote to John Carpenter saying what I'd said. And um, he wrote back to him, I saw the letter, saying, no, um, the, the, uh, it wasn't. The, um, the, the aliens, you know, in, inside the people, um, I, I, I was um, symbolizing the uh, Republicans. And you go, yeah, John, all right. Yeah, okay, you were, yeah. I mean, I mean anyone who's seen They Live will laugh at that. Um, and I, I think, you, you know, if you look at um, They Live, it's classic. Uh, and, and that time back too, where you have a small number of people who are actually um, not what they seem. They look human to people of everyday life, but when the guy put the sunglasses on that allowed him to decode reality on another level, that was the symbolism of it, he saw that they actually, behind the human form, they weren't human at all. And they were the people in power. They were the bankers, they were the politicians, they were the president, they were some of the police. Uh, and um, also, when he put the glasses on, uh, on that subliminal level, he could see all the subliminal messages um, all around him, um, telling him to, to stay asleep, to not question, to obey authority. And it was a, a, a movie, it was kind of a B movie, wasn't it? A kind of, lot, most people would never have heard of. And yet, it was way ahead of its time in portraying the world that we're actually living in. Because of the way society has been structured, it's like this, when humans or awareness comes into human embodiment. You're born into a madhouse and you grow up in the madhouse and you've never known anything different to the madhouse. Therefore, to you, the madhouse is normal. So when anyone comes along and says, this is a madhouse, look at it. They go, he's mad, because to you, normal is insanity. And that's how it works. And so what is happening when we talk about people waking up, they're waking up from the spell, they're waking up from the program. And then suddenly, the mad guy don't seem so mad anymore. Because you can start to see the madness. Um, and that's what, that's what it is. You know, people will say, I, I, I'm seeking enlightenment. We don't have to seek enlightenment, we are enlightened. That's our, that's our natural state of, of being. What's happened is this distortion has distorted our sense of perception and that distortion, distorted perception has disconnected us from that level of us that is infinitely enlightened. That's what we, the, the human, human perception has been hijacked. Once again, our contic cannot create human awareness but it can piggyback it and distort it so it perceives the world that suits the distortion. That's what's happening. It's important to understand because there's a lot of video uh, online. Oh look, so-and-so uh, shapeshifted. He or she is a reptilian. Maybe, maybe not. Depending on the proportion of a particular genetics dictates whether you can shapeshift. Because of the, the, the programming of the physical, they say that's not, not possible, you're mad. You can't move from a physical form to another physical form. And, and you know they're right, but that ain't what's happening. The higher the proportion of either Anunnaki, and that's coming back to your final point now, um, or Nephilim, the higher the genetics of that, the more you can shapeshift. And the more reptilian you have in you, you can also shapeshift. The problem is that it's very hard to control shapeshifting. Sometimes the person could just be very tired and maybe spend a lot of time around a negatively energized, what's been described as an organic portal, some really negatively energized hosted person. Maybe they had a relationship with that person, maybe they spent too much time with that person, but somehow or other, the, these entities had, had attached themselves to the auric field of that person and momentarily they shapeshift. You can't just say, today I will shapeshift. It will happen in certain circumstances. 
um, and also people who are psychic can see it change the change in the person but those who are, who are not psychic can't see it it's a trojan horse scenario you have somebody who looks human who has a human position who was once fully human but has been taken over often as not these shapeshifters they're in positions of authority whether it's in a local company or a corporation or uh, or high-ranking mucky mucks on the world stage people are, are seeing shape-shifting going on it's real Somehow, sometimes they appear in uh, people's homes. So how do they get there? Well, they can arrive simply by materializing, first appearing as an invisible energy and then fading in and becoming visible. For instance, in one case, a hypnotherapist was working with an abductee when he saw the impressions of the reptilian's hand on her arm, as if the reptilian was standing behind her in some sort of invisible form. Uh, moments later, the reptilian materialized and became visible, and associated with that, there was a rush of air and a crackle of static electricity. In other cases, the reptilians can appear as a blue, white, or red ball of light, perhaps around the size of a grapefruit, that floats through the air as if it's under intelligent control. This ball can then open up and become a reptilian being. Uh, sometimes they come through a portal which may appear in the person's bedroom, closet, or in the wall. The portals have been described in various ways. Often there's a kind of rippling effect around the edges, like heat waves coming off the surface of a road on a hot day. Sometimes there's light emanating from the portal. As for the technology they use, sometimes no technology is seen. Uh, the reptilians may simply materialize or dematerialize as if of their own will, uh, perhaps a paraphysical ability rather than a technology. Uh, and in some cases, uh, you know, well, maybe it's a technology that's just unseen because it's built into them in some way. Um, in other cases, reptilians have been seen wearing a kind of a utility belt, and they can press a button that allows them to, to beam themselves out of the, the, the area. Um, or they may hold a silver rod, kind of shaped like a carrot, which they point at the direction where they want a portal to open. What I want to explain is how a super soldier is related to this equation. And this basically goes back to after World War II, when over 10,000 Nazi scientists were brought back into the United States through Project Paperclip. And um, they were allowed to continue their experiments into trauma, torture, and mind control in deep military underground bases, or also known as DUMS. The government's always been trying to make, or governments, uh, military leaders have always been trying to make a perfect soldier. Uh, of course, you know, you could take people who are highly psychic and very gifted and enhance their psychic abilities through uh, torture, basically splitting the mind, creating altars, and that, that's the old way of doing it. Those are those generation of super soldiers were called ultras. But later down the road, they realized that just by cranking up people's aggression or even giving them, um, putting implants and putting wires under their skin to enhance their uh, physical strength, it can, it can only go so far. Eventually, these people were, were cracking. They're just a total mess. So um, through their treaties and agreements, they um, allowed or were, they were already working with extraterrestrials, but um, certain groups of reptilians who are already very gifted when it comes to computers, uh, when it comes to nanotechnology and um, robotics. Of course, all that goes into mind control, but um, these reptilians were um, started working on projects with human personnel in these underground bases. As soon as I got out of the car, she got out of the car too, and we walked around to the back of the four-wheel drive to get out the equipment. And as soon as I'm turning to, to pull up the back of the, the boot, 
there was one of the Draco reptilians to, it was basically behind Carol on an angle. Now, at this time, it was phasing in and out like a, dist uh, like a distortion, how would you say? It was sort of be like a hologram tuning in and out with static, and it was coming in and out. And straight away, I just said to her, get in the car. I got into the car. At that time, um, like this would have only been 10 metres away. And it had horns, it's got the wings. I couldn't tell you what colour, but when they were projected to me, they were yellowish brown colour. Big, like maybe eight, nine foot tall, something like, it was big. But it was only 10 metres away, and in the distance, maybe 150 metres away, is a street light out there. It's the only light in the whole area, because it's out of town in a swimming area, like where people take their boats and their kids and have picnics. So because of that, I sort of had a good reference to see it. Even though, you know, usually you can see stuff with the shadow dudes in the dark, you can still get something. But when we hopped in the car at this time, the lights on the interior, on the, on the speedo, on the dashboard, and the outside lights all turned on at different times. They were all, you know, it was like a disco of lights. No reason for, for it to be happening. And I'm trying to turn on the car, and after some time, I just sort of blasted it with love in my mind anyway. And it got a little bit more intense, and then I did it again. Then all of a sudden, like in my mind, it's just like, just start the car. And the car started at that time, so I've reversed out, floored it out of there. And got on my way. Welcome to Phenomena. We have a very big old freak of nature here. There's a reptilian life on the news. Let me zoom out. Sorry, a bit nervous. Having dinner. Um, doing a bit of fishing. Now, let's show you the, the background, ladies and gentlemen. He's lost the top of his head for the love of God. In, or his wrist certainly in some uh, bandage or plaster so uh, you monster oh, he's losing his holographic he's form isn't it in the southwest um and in the last hour as oh, well the we bus. have um, oh. we, added, and we cannot done, lose this this could be gold for invitations to the no they're going to what is that so good ah i got him good mum i got him good i've got him i've got him i've got him he's got him he's got him oh my god ah he's a bloody monster we are seeing the evil for what it is, ladies and gentlemen. Fishing, watch the fucking news. Um, my understanding so far has been that certainly there does seem to be some of the greys and some of the reptilians seem to be the main ones that seem to come through with the MyLab. But what a lot of people don't understand, and it's something I've only in the last few years learnt, there seems to be... Um, some that look like the greys and some that look like reptilians seem to be, um, if you like, grown or cloned. And these are programmed by military that are not, in fact, the genuine article. So that in itself, they're called program life forms and they're programmed, as I say, and there is a different energy signature between those and the real ones. And um, some gentlemen that I've heard of testimony um, have said that to meet them, there is a coldness and um, a real sense of fear around them. It's like they really do feel very dark. And so again, it's, it's, it must be very hard for a frightened experiencer to be in a scenario where they're facing one of these program life forms and believing that this is an ET, um, and in fact it isn't. So it's a very, very complex, um, if you like, um, and with many layers which was, you know, I'm still as a researcher trying to work out. I got into the alternative scene first in early of 2013 when I uploaded my first reptilian shapeshifter movies. And at that time, I experienced a complete change in my life, which has continued to this day due to the reaction that I got from the police and other vehicles that continued to follow me, harass me, and buzz me all throughout town, everywhere I go, every single day, and also at night. Okay, so here's New Year's Day 2014, and you know, it's New Year's Day, so no one's out. Everything's very quiet, and these guys went ballistic, and here's where you're going to see the micro UFOs, and I'll show you that in a second, but here you'll notice that this guy these uh, police and police helicopters 
were circling directly over my house and you can see from the curvature of the flight path of the helicopter that there's zero doubt that it's circling directly overhead so you, you can see that the circle angle is right over my apartment and now here is little micro UFOs and I'm going to show you in a second and prove to you that these are actually little micro metal spy orbs of some kind or just you know little micro UFOs I don't know for sure what they are they may even be uh, aliens. Looks like a bird here, doesn't it? But watch carefully. I'll keep showing this. See? That's the same object further up as it moves past the helicopter there. You see it moving here like that. And I'll do several zoom in so that you can really see it. But there's no question. It's a little metal object. You can fully see the light refracting off of it. I was sitting in the lounge and um I wanted to go to the loo and to get from the lounge to the loo you had to pass through the corner of the kitchen there's a door door here and then you went through a door there as I went through that door there just gonna go into that door there there's a reptilian standing there it was tall I mean I didn't have my tape measure on me or anything but it was <laughs> it was a lot taller than me and it was Crouched like that, it, it was green, it had these kind of orangey slit eyes, it had a paler chest, it had like ridges and scales. But the thing about it was that it looked at me and what I felt was from him was, oh shit it's in me. <laughs> It was more kind of worried that I'd seen it than, any, than having any kind of negative intent towards me or whatsoever. And I'm on the move, you see, when I see this, and I'm just gonna step into the hallway to go to the loo. And as I saw it, I, I was in mid-flight, so I didn't, couldn't stop immediately, so I went like that, came back and it had gone. And, but the whole room, was not the room. It was standing in the corner of the room, where the corner of the room should have been, but the room wasn't there. It was another dimension in, in you know, I, I'd walked through another dimension. I got on the plane and they swapped my seat for some reason. And I sat down in this other seat and I noticed there was an Indian lady in the sari and everything sitting there. And she was looking at me intently like that. But her eyes were really lovely. She was really kind of, you could tell it was, a, it was really loving whatever she was doing, you know, but she was doing something. I saw this guy in a seat in front of me just to look along. He rose up and turned into this huge reptilian, like really aggressive. This air hostess came to me and this don't happen, does it? She, she knelt down next to me. She put her hand on my knee and she was going, we're gonna look after you. Everything will be all right. And then this Indian lady, I heard this voice in my mind and it was definitely coming from her. And she said, you are a golden child and very special. We are looking after you. And I thought, what's a golden child? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's what Same movie, isn't it? that's what she said yeah maybe i don't know One of the important things throughout all of their interaction with humanity was not to be recognized and not to be seen because humans record. Humans record in stone. 
we're very good at that. We create, we're fantastic like that as a race. So they, they, they recreate and the reptilians didn't want that. Um, you will see it occasionally in some of the um, Sumerian or Assyrian Babylonian carvings occasionally. You will also see it in some of the Mayan or Aztec uh, items. What you're much more likely to see are, are renditions of feline species from, from the Egyptian times because they weren't covered by the same protocol. So they weren't, um, there was no ban on um, depicting them whereas there is a ban, there still is now a ban on depicting reptilians and I'll give you uh, absolute proof of that when I did that very nice interview on the uh, Today programme with Holly Willoughby and Schofield and I did two drawings, one of uh, a mantid and one of a reptile and I was told point blank we're not allowed to put the reptile up because they were going to have me as a backdrop, uh, them as a backdrop to me so uh, the stills I've got, which they very kindly sent me, now I'm being interviewed with them, and behind me is a picture of the mantid. But originally, Schofield and gang were going to have the mantid and the reptile, and somebody very high up said, we're not allowed. They didn't even know what it was called. All they said to me was, we've been told we can't put this one up. So there's a, a, a blanket that goes out, and hence, if you think about what your title of this DVD is, because we're coming round to that now, and you think about that chapter in The Greatest Secret that David Icke wrote, which was don't mention the reptiles. And that's, that's a fact, and David is absolutely right, that the, the system doesn't want to publicize them because they have signed an agreement not to publicize them. It's to keep them out. So you can talk about the greys as much as you want. That's not an issue. You can talk about the mantid as much as you want because they don't manipulate humanity. The reptile race that we're talking about manipulates humanity and has done for thousands of years and has a covenant with the elite humans who run the world that they will always be in the shadows. You have to understand that, that, that most reptilians will look on humans as, as the lowest of the low. When dealing with military, um, they have a first interaction protocol where the humans have to bow to them. Um, after that, they don't have to do that because they've already shown their, their subservience to them. If you look at um, very wealthy bloodline families, um, the reptilians look on them <clears throat> as not equals, but as the anointed ones, the anointed ones of power. So they don't have to bow generally. For instance, if a Rothschild uh, grouping, the, the alien will have the, the reptile will have the head chair. There'll be a beautiful carved chair somewhere. And that's where he will sit and then the family will sit round. They don't have to bow at that point, but there will be a ceremonial point where they have to do the bowing. But you're really talking to me about uh, an ordinary Joe or Josephine in the house and the reptilian comes in. That's very rare. That's incredibly rare. Reptiles do not generally come into a house to waste their time with a human. They'll send a grey. But where a reptile does come down, it's because that individual is so important that it requires an interaction from the high level. Again, it depends on that individual. What is that person to them? What is that person to humanity? Um, and they have, for want of a better word, time machines where they can predict ahead what each person will do. And if they see a person is a threat to them, they will attempt to come along, interact with them, and send them off on a different course. There are many, many psychic men and women on the planet who, um, if left to their own devices, will be incredibly beneficial and so what the system will do is try and target uh, a disruptive male to, to get involved with a female or vice versa and to make that person's life hell. Um, everything and anything to make somebody not think about themselves. So it's all part and parcel of what happens. Um, what will a reptile do? Well, a reptile will come in um, uh, and generally it won't, it won't disguise itself heavily because if it's come to meet somebody, that person is considered important enough for them to be there and they'll only disguise themselves to prevent that human freaking out.